on the right, most of you on your uh, computer, uh, is an area for asking questions. And that would be the, uh, we will use that today as our primary vehicle. Uh, so if, as you have questions, uh, key them into the questions area. If um, our, our format today will be, uh, Laurel will speak for 40 or 45 minutes and then we'll leave plenty of time for questions at the end. So, um, and then uh, we'll be, I'll be uh, managing and monitoring those. If we see one that comes up that uh, makes sense for us to interrupt and break in, we will. Otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll hold them towards the end. Uh, and it's with my great pleasure to introduce Laurel. Laurel? Thank you so much, Rob, and um, good afternoon, everyone. I want to echo the thanks for joining us today. I know it's late in the day, and hopefully, for some of you, at least those of you on the East Coast, that hopefully this next hour will be time well spent. I want to also thank JMT Consulting for offering this opportunity both um, to the attendees and also, obviously, to me. So I want to start by actually asking those of you that are on the line a question. What comes to mind when you hear the words impact measurement? And as Rob mentioned, you have an interface there on your computer where you can submit responses, questions. Um, I, want to, I want you to sort of send those our way. Um, and I also want to sort of set up the caveat that you're not going to hurt my feelings. It's okay to be honest here. If Something that comes to mind with impact measurement is along the lines of, ah, I wish I could pull my, pulling my hair out at this point. That's okay. That's honest and genuine. So um, just take a minute and reflect what comes to mind when you hear the words impact measurement. And Rob, when you have some of those coming in, um, please feel free to, to share what people are feeling on this topic. I definitely will. Great. Any, uh, any tidbits coming in yet? And again, invite everybody to send them in if you're typing now. Um, go ahead and hit send so we can see where you're coming from today. Yes, a lot of shy folks here on the phone so far. <laughs> okay. Okay. I've got, um, uh, let's just take a look and so I can see these. We're a hunger relief organization. Um, uh, so, uh, and poverty eradication impacts mm -hmm. disease a number of, number of families. Mm -hmm. uh, important to quantify. Uh, wishing I had time to meet funders reporting requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's another one. Mm -hmm. um, those are both good. If you have some, keep them coming. That will be helpful for us. Uh, Absolutely. Um, let's see here what this one was. Um, difficult. So um, that so at the oh, let's see there it is. Those right are there. nope. Those I don't are know. great. Those are good. Those are those are great ones to start, and they kind of hit the gamut. So just want to start with the one that explained the mission so, and it, yeah, and acknowledge that. that and, it, and acknowledge that, um, you know, that is the root of impact measurement is being really clear about what is the ultimate impact and then what information do you need to understand whether it's happening. And so we're going to touch on that today. The other part, um, the other comment that was acknowledged is that's difficult. And, I, and I'm not here to tell you it's easy, but I certainly am hoping in the next hour I can give you a roadmap to tackle this step by step and perhaps make it easier than. Um, it might otherwise be without a plan. And to the person that mentioned the funders, um, obviously there's a dynamic here with funders. When I started teaching on outcome measures, I was working in-house at a Boys and Girls Club, and one of their largest um, funders at the time explained they're moving towards this thing called outcome-based funding, and shockwaves made their way through um, the sector. And, you know, it was an acknowledgement that there was a shift away from tracking, sorry, funding people based on reputation and number of people served and moving more towards answering the question, so what? And how are those folks different or better off? So clearly the funders in a lot of cases are pushing for this. Um, and it will certainly require time both to have conversations with funders and to think about it and measure it. But what I hope you take from today is that it's also um, meant to be useful for you internally to really see are you achieving that mission, those very important missions that I'm sure are represented on the line today. All right, we're gonna go ahead and move into, speaking of the content for the day and the roadmap, 
Um, a, a quote that I like to um, reference when I'm teaching on impact measurement. I'm not sure where we're going, but we're making great time. And if you're like me, that kind of causes you to chuckle a little bit because it is a little bit hard to imagine feeling really great about making great time when you have no sense of ultimately where you're going. And why I like to present that quote is because if we focus as providers um, on just checking things off our to-do list, keeping track of all of the services we're providing without a clear sense of where we're ultimately going, we're a lot like that driver that's heading down the road feeling really great about making great time. What we want to do through impact measurement and clarifying the ultimate changes or benefits we're trying to make in, in our work is get crystal clear about where you ultimately want to end up. Think of it like your programmatic GPS. Where do you hope the folks you serve, the people you interact with are at the end of their engagement with you? How do you hope they take what you've worked with them on and apply it after you've stopped working with them? If you have clarity and can en enter that in, kind of beginning with the end in mind, inevitably you're going to be able to plan programs and activities that are aligned to achieve that outcome. So as you're progressing, as you're making great time, you have the sense that you're on the path to somewhere meaningful. And so to me, impact measurement is really about another way of thinking. It's really about a shift. As I was talking years ago when I was at Boys and Girls Club and that first shift was felt in those organizations from um, not just focusing on activities, but really focusing on impact, right? Getting really clear about how you hope to make a difference in the world and ensuring that you have the information you need to understand whether that difference is happening. And if it's not happening, what you might be able to do to course correct. And now think about, again, that GPS metaphor. If you're heading down the road and a roadblock pops up and you have to get off and exit, your GPS will recalibrate or recalculate to keep you on the path to where you ultimately want to go. If you have clarity in your program design for what your ultimate outcomes are, and you're collecting information along the way, you can maneuver around those roadblocks and progress and still stay on target. So what we want you to do by focusing on impact is really get clear about where you're going and have that reassurance as you're making great time through your activities that you're on the way to someplace meaningful. Why else is it important? Well, you, you hit on a lot of it in your very candid responses to the initial question. It gives you really valuable information. First and foremost, and I always start with this, um, because this to me is the real payoff for the work, it gives you information to better understand your work. Are the things you thought were gonna happen actually happening for the folks you work with? How much of it's happening? If it's not happening, do you have a sense of why? These are really important questions because I'm guessing all of you on the line are in this line of work because you want to make a difference. So this is meant to give you information to better understand your work and ultimately to make informed decisions. So you're not blindly heading down a road on the path to nowhere. You're monitoring the path that you've set out for yourself, identifying if you're still on track, making course corrections. If you're seeing really positive results, putting more resources towards those efforts. If you're seeing it's not happening exactly how you planned, making informed decisions to course correct or recalibrate your plan. The other really valuable thing about having data that talks about your impact is it allows you to communicate your, about your work in a really meaningful way by talking about the difference you're making in people's lives. So a lot of times as nonprofit providers, and I include myself in this, by the way, because in addition to being a trainer, I also continue to do some direct service work as a volunteer um, and through some other capacities. And I will say, I you often fall in the into the trap of checking things off a list, and doing the things you know in your plan. And when you talk about your work, sometimes you can talk about, well, you know, we provided this many trainings, or we did this many case management sessions. And what that does, it says something, but it's not quite as compelling as, as answering the question, so what? So I did a training, and so what? I've helped nonprofit professionals get clarity about outcome measures and a path forward to achieving those. 
or I provided case management sessions, well, so what? Well, now the individuals I worked with, formerly homeless individuals, are in more stable housing. Right, so it puts a face to the difference that you're making and allows you to talk about your work in a more meaningful way. And then, of course, I want to acknowledge what I'm sure a number of you are thinking. It's, an, it's necessary to help ensure that you can secure the kind of support you need to keep doing the work you're doing. And so certainly funders want to have that information because, by the way, they're investing in you. They have a mission to achieve, and their only way to achieve their mission is through their grant. So part of the motivation for asking questions and um, wanting to know more about your impact is to understand whether they're making their impact. Um, but this is also about securing people to support your work. So if you can talk about the difference you're making in the world, then you're probably going to get staff and volunteers who are motivated and excited to support it. It's much more exciting to talk about contributing to changing people's lives than it is about you know, a certain number of meetings or a certain number of group sessions. And so think about in terms of securing quality people that want to be part of making the difference. And then also partners, you know, partners want to be part of an organization that's thinking about the difference they're trying to make and paying attention to whether it's happening. So for all of these reasons, really getting clear about your impact and having data to support it is really critical. I'm guessing I'm sort of preaching to the choir at this point because you're all on the call, so probably at some point, at some level, you understand the value. And so I'm guessing what's running through some of your minds is, is a little bit of what we're going to walk through right now. You may have accepted all that I just said and say, okay, but sounds good. I don't know where to begin. It seems like a tremendously overwhelming process. I have no idea where to begin. Oh, and by the way, I'm also worried it will be too expensive, too time intensive, too unruly, right? Some of you are probably thinking, yeah, Laurel, sounds good, but I tried before and ended up way more confused and frustrated than I wanted to be. How is this time going to be different? Or sounds great, but we're a really small nonprofit. We don't have a lot of resources. We don't have an expert on staff to help us through this. We can't afford a fancy you know, outside consultants to support us. How are we supposed to move forward? Okay, but we're too unique. Our results are too difficult to quantify. Again, I want to acknowledge everyone has meaningful and unique outcomes, but this process, as we walk through it, um, is meant to sort of serve any mission, any organization. And in my nearly 20 years of doing this consulting work, I've worked with organizations of all different sizes, all different ages, all different missions, and the steps we're gonna walk through are really designed to react to and respond to the uniqueness of your programs and your outcomes, but also get you to something you can quantify. And I'm sure some of you are saying, yeah, 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 but it's gonna drain resources away from our real work, our work with the client. And so I wanna acknowledge there may be some truth if, again, if some or all of these rang true to you, you're not alone. I hear this a lot when I'm teaching on this subject. Um, and they're, they're valid. I understand that a lot of times this can feel overwhelming. I understand that there is a very real fear that it's gonna be so expensive or unruly that it's gonna be a real drain on the organization. And I certainly can understand if you've tried before and gotten stuck. But as I said before, the, the method that we're going to walk through, the steps that we're going to walk through, are steps that I've developed over years of working with nonprofits, and they're steps I think that you'll find universally relevant, regardless of your mission. And they're steps that are purposely designed to be able to be done in-house, without an expert. Um, because, by the way, you're the experts on your work. Right? This process is meant to inform and support your work. And so you're the experts on the content. This framework will hopefully just help you think through what you already know and guide you towards that path of, of tracking outcomes. So I'm guessing hopefully by now you're, you know, hearing that I understand you. And I, I want to validate if you have any of those concerns. But I also want to emphasize that I feel really strongly that this issue is just too important to ignore. Not just because funders are asking, although that has continued to be a trend since back in my Boys and Girls Club days to now, 
more and more funders are asking. And I want to acknowledge also, by the way, funders can create some of the challenges here by asking for too much or asking for all sorts of different things. Again, this process is meant to help you navigate those challenges. But the good thing about the fact that funders initiated the conversation is I think now nonprofits are realizing this is helpful for us in our own work. And if for no other reason you're doing it for your own work, um, I think you would agree it is just really just too important to ignore. So what is the key? What is the thing that I've discovered over my years of working with nonprofits? I like to summarize it by saying the key is a kiss. And I'm not saying here, keep it simple, stupid. I don't, I don't know any of you. I wouldn't dare to say that, although you may be familiar with the kiss method. In, in this instance, for me, the kiss method is keep it simple strategically. Because the, the reason that this can feel overwhelming and can feel like I don't know where to begin and I'm really worried about um, where this is all headed and getting out of control is that without a very deliberate plan and without a purposeful intention to keep things simple strategically, it can get overwhelming. And you want to take it step by step and ensure each step of the way you keep your eye on the ultimate goal. And for me, the ultimate goal for the organizations that I work with and for is that you have the information you need to understand whether the difference you're trying to make is happening and to course correct or make adjustments if it's not happening. And so if the end game is that you have data, then we want to make sure that you get there and avoid some of the common pitfalls and some of the common challenges. And so the steps that we're going to walk through in a minute are really designed to do just that. So my five steps to keeping it simple strategically, and by the way, as Rob mentioned, you'll get a slide deck, the slide deck as, um, you know, for your reference after the session. And we'll also provide an additional handout to help guide some of your thinking around these steps. But these are steps that have evolved, both from what the research says and best practices and case studies in the work, and also my firsthand knowledge and experience with organizations that have grappled with these very same issues that you're grappling with. So step one, ensure that your program is outcome focused, that it's aligned with your constituent needs, your services, and your mission. Now, this may seem like a no-brainer, but I will tell you, after years and years of doing this, this can be the place that is the major tripping point for an organization. They jump into measuring. They say, let's do a pre and post test. Let's do a survey. Let's do an assessment. But they've never quite stopped to think, what are realistic outcomes to expect? And are those outcomes really logically connected and tied to the services we provide? And are they rooted in the need that exists in the community? And if you haven't mapped out a program plan that takes into account all of those pieces and ensures they're logically connected, chances are you're not going to be in a position to make the most impact as possible. And so if and when the time comes and you're measuring, chances are you're not going to see the results you hoped for. And it might be because you just haven't thought carefully about the need and how it connects to your services or your services and how well they're aligned to achieve your outcomes. So as I said, there will be a handout that you'll get that will help you brainstorm these components. But just really quickly, for anyone that's heard of something like a theory of change or a logic model or an outcomes framework, they're all essentially getting at this core idea that there's a logical connection, an if-then logic, between what you do as a service provider, the if side, and the then side, how are people then going to be different or better off? What are the outcomes that you're expecting? And all of that ideally should be rooted with a clear understanding of what need exists in the community that you're seeking to address. And what I mean by that is not, we need to accommodate this funder's request, or I need to do this because my boss is asking, or we need to do this because the board wants us to do it. It's need that exists in the community among those you serve, homeless individuals, 
um, young children, early childhood development, um, any number of missions that you might have. What needs do they have that your program is in a position to help address? And getting crystal clear about those points is critical because that then becomes the driving force for what you measure and how you measure. So as I said, in my experience, anytime I work with an organization, even if they say, oh, we're good, we understand our outcomes, we just need help with our data collection, I always ask them to kind of show me their thinking. Because sometimes there might be a breakdown in what you do in the activities because you've always done them and what you're expecting around outcomes. You haven't looked closely at the connection. So you want to make sure there's a really nice, tight, logical connection that shows your theory of change, the theory about how what you're doing is going to lead to change for your constituents. Once you have that in place, and that 100% is the starting point for any engagement, the next thing you want to do is choose what you're going to track wisely. So I've had groups that I've worked with over the years that um, had clarity about their outcomes and had a wonderful list of very logically connected outcomes that they identified. And then what they did was they felt like they had to track everything that they could possibly achieve with their clients. And as a result, they overextended themselves and they tried to track too much. And when they started to get data in, they didn't know which of the data was really the most important to be paying attention to. And when times got a little tricky and they, they needed, it became harder and harder to track data, they didn't have a sense of which data they should be really committing to tracking. And so they ended up either stopping tracking or having a whole bunch of data with no real idea of how to make sense of it. That's challenge number two. And this step is meant to help prevent you from falling into that potential um, trap. Choose what you're going to track wisely. So once you have clarity about your outcomes and you feel like they're logically connected to need and in your services, I want you to try and prioritize what are the most important outcomes. At the end of the day, if these outcomes aren't happening, if my constituents aren't changing or benefiting in some way, if I'm not having this impact, we really have an issue here. Chances are there's going to be a couple outcomes that rise to the top of that list. I encourage you to start there. Commit to tracking those couple of things that feel super important. And make your way through the rest of the steps that we're going to talk about in a minute until you really built your capacity to not just track, but compile and review and use. Because again, the end result for you is that you have data you use to inform your decisions. Get all the way to that finish line, and then you can always add more data to track. But if you overcommit up front, you're going to be like a lot of the clients that I've been called in to support. You're going to have a lot of data and have no capacity to keep up either with the tracking of it or the reviewing with it. And you kind of undermine the point of the process if you don't get to that point. Step three, keep your data collection practical. Again, I've had clients that have a really good sense of what their outcomes are. They've even gone so far as prioritizing as it relates to step two but they make the mistake of thinking their data collection has to be complicated. They think the more complicated, the better. The more elaborate, the better. In my experience, the opposite is true. You certainly want to have valid measures. You want to have something that's going to give you information that's actually informing and telling you what's happening. But if you think of data collection as an add-on to what you're doing, as opposed to something that's embedded into your work, it's very likely that that complicated add-on is going to fall to the wayside when the going gets tough. So the image I like to create is sort of imagine your work as a giant ball or boulder. If you treat your data collection like an add-on on top of that boulder, it might be fine while the boulder is just sitting there. But say that boulder starts rolling down the hill, what's sort of the metaphorical ball gets rolling in your program, things get busy. What's the first thing that's going to fly off? It's going to be the thing that was never really embedded. And so data collection and this information is too important to just fly off. So look at your current system. Do you have a current intake process that you do with your client? Are you asking questions there that inform your outcomes? Are there opportunities to tweak an existing tool or process? Or thinking about technologies that exist. Are you actually thinking practically about 
what can feasibly done be done by staff in the midst of their program delivery. So where I've seen organizations get into trouble here, again, is coming up with a system that sounds great in theory, but is just too complicated or impractical to implement or keep up. And if that's the case, chances are it's going to fall to the wayside. And here again, you end up without the data that you need to inform your decisions. So wherever possible, I encourage you to embed your data collection into your work and incorporate existing mechanisms. They might need to be tweaked as you figure out what you want to track. You might tweak a form or a database field. But if you can find a way as much as possible to incorporate into your existing processes, I think you'll find that you're avoiding pitfall number three, which is having things that are too um, complicated. Step four, now this is one where you're probably thinking, okay, well, why would I bother to go through all this if I wasn't actually gonna use the findings? But I will tell you, a number of my clients say, we, we, had so, we spent so much time and energy talking about our outcomes and prioritizing and coming up with the tools and collecting, we didn't think ahead to what, was gonna, what it was gonna take to actually use our findings. And so we just forgot. We checked these first three things off the list and then we went on and about our business. And so I add this as step number four for you to consciously think ahead to how are you gonna use this information? Who needs it? When do they need it? How are they gonna get it in a format that's useful? And this is where compiling your data is so key. So I'm guessing if I took a poll right now and asked how many of you have collected hard copy surveys, it would be a pretty high number. And then if I ask how many of you have actually processed those versus have a stack of surveys that you've never quite gotten around to, right? You may have a sort of equivalent of that example in your organization. If that's the case, you've kind of, you've gotten stuck in number three, right? You've collected the data. Maybe you collected it in a way that was practical, a hard copy form, but you didn't think ahead to how you were gonna use it and therefore what that meant in terms of compiling it and when it would need to be compiled. So if you think ahead to how you're gonna use it when you need it, this may bring to light, one, the need to plan time and resources to support that, thinking about you know, what kind of technology might be able to help, thinking about people's schedules and whether you need to put time on people's calendars at the end of each quarter, at the end of each program cycle to review the data. If you don't do something like that, if you don't make an active effort to think ahead, you can easily find yourself like a number of the organizations I worked with, with a lot of data and good intentions, but still not quick to the finish line of actually using the data. And again, we want to get you to a place where you actually are using the data. What I have found for organizations that think through step four, by the way, is that sometimes that means they go back to number two and they say, wow, like to actually collect and compile all of this and put it in a format that will be useful is gonna be a lot of work. I think we have to narrow our priority list down even further. And if that's the case, I say, great, better to do it now than to, again, commit to tracking a lot of things and not have um, that information at the end of the day. Okay, so understand that these steps, these four steps, are they, they are designed to influence one another. So you do step one to get to step two, you do step two to get to step three, and so on. But sometimes when you get to a step further down the list, you may go back to the beginning and refine it a little further, and that's normal. And if you're saying to yourself, well, who has time to do all of this from a planning perspective? I want to say again, I hear you, but I also want to say, it's time better spent to think it through now than to invest time and energy and resources into tracking things you never get around to looking at. Because not only does that waste the time, but it also probably hurts morale because people are collecting data and wondering, well, where is this, gonna, where is this going to be used? Why, why am I doing this? So again, thinking ahead to the ultimate point of the process, actually using your findings. As my mom would say, you're not collecting data for your health, right? This isn't for my health, I'm not doing it. You're doing it so that you actually have information you can use. And so again, if that means keeping a laser focus, keeping it simple strategically by focusing on just a couple things so that you get to the end game, I'm all for it. And then you can always build your capacity further 
as you move um, on and get more comfortable with this process. The other point I just want to make here, um, this is just another way to think about what I was just talking about. So imagine this circle that's on the screen is representative of the total amount of time you have to give to a particular program. Now, I want to say the triangles, the pieces are not drawn to scale, but there are there needs to be time carved out for each of these four quadrants. So let me talk you through. The top right being planning the program. I would guess most of you spend at least some time planning programs. Maybe not as much as you would like, but I would guess some of you do. I would say if you plan it according to step one on the previous slide, use a framework with a clear outcome focus, you're going to be way ahead of a lot of groups that struggle with this. So sort of deliberately planning a program with a clear understanding of your outcomes is a great way to start. And then I would guess the, the rest of the time for a lot of you is spent in the next quadrant down below, implementing the program and perhaps collecting data as you go. Right? But if you're like a lot of clients that I've worked with, you may have, as I said before, forgotten about these last two quadrants. You may have thought, well, that's not my role. Someone else will sort of think about this piece of it. And so as an organization, you have to be very mindful that you need to factor in the time and resources for all four quadrants. Because it's not enough just to implement the program. What impact measurement, what outcome measurement is asking is to collect data to understand if the way that you're implementing it is actually leading to where you hoped it would lead. And so you plan, if we look at the arrows on the outside, the thing I want to to underscore here is you're planning your program so that you can implement and you're implementing and hopefully collecting data as you're doing the work as opposed to that add-on on top of other things and you're collecting it so that you can compile it right you're not collecting it just to collect it you're collecting it so you can compile it and you're compiling it so you ultimately can look at it in aggregate not client by client but let me look at the total group of folks that we worked with and let me use the information to understand if things that we thought were going to happen are happening. And if you see really great results, this is having compiled data gives you the chance to share that information externally, to tell your impact story to those funders, to partners, to clients, to staff, to really talk about your work, as I said before, from the perspective of how people are different. But the other thing it does, as the arrow suggests, is you review it so that you might potentially plan your program differently. So as opposed to blindly heading down that road, making great time, this is a chance to stop and say, are we heading where we want to go? And if not, do we need to adjust our plan? And so this process is meant to be iterative. It's meant to sort of inform each step along the way and come back to the beginning and sort of ask yourself, is this where we wanted to go? And if not, what should we do differently? And so, again, just want to underscore the importance of leaving time and allocating resources for all four quadrants, because that's where groups fall into the most trouble. And I'll say, whenever I put this slide up on a screen in a workshop setting, people, you know, come up afterward and take pictures of it, because it resonates. I'm guessing for some of you, this resonates as well, the need to leave time for the last two quadrants. So I just want to quickly recap the key points. And then, as Rob said at the outset, we're going to leave plenty of time for questions. So if you have questions that have been bubbling up as I've gone through this, I hope you've been sending Rob those questions. If you haven't, um, feel free to start typing them now, because in about five minutes or so, we'll all start fielding those questions. But before I do that, because I feel like I've thrown a lot at you in the last um, 35 minutes, I want to just quickly recap the key themes as it relates to becoming an organization that is capable of measuring its impact, okay? First is, and you've heard me say it many different ways today, you, you really do have to set, a time, set aside time and resources. First and foremost, to plan with an outcome focus. I'm going to say something somewhat controversial for a measurement webinar, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you don't believe you have the capacity to measure right yet, don't worry about that part of it just yet. What you definitely want to spend your time and resources on, though, is number one. You want to make sure that you're planning your program from the get-go with an outcome focus. That's going to support your measurement 
when you have the capacity to track it, which will hopefully be soon. But what it also does is it gets everybody on the same page with a clear idea of ultimately where you want to end up. So if you think about your work, I'm going to use another Boulder metaphor here. If you think about your work as an organization and the progress you're trying to make as a giant boulder, and every staff member and volunteer that's working with you has a rope tied to that boulder. Without planning with an outcome focus, you ask the staff and volunteers to help you make progress, chances are you're probably all going to be heading roughly in the same direction. No one hopefully is way off course. So the boulder will move. But the difference between that and clear a clear vision of where you ultimately want to end up that you get by planning with an outcome focus is that if you have that dot on the horizon everyone's pulling towards, chances are you're going to move further and faster. So again, my plug here is first and foremost, plan with an outcome focus. Bring your program team together with your development team. Bring your supervisors together with your um, direct line staff. Make sure everybody understands where you're ultimately trying to get that boulder and ensure your resources and your services are aligned with it. That's going to put you in a great position when it comes time to measure. And at the very least, it ensures your resources are being put to good use at this point. I will say, obviously, step two, delivering the program, that's kind of key to all of this as well. Um, but the, the connection as it relates to measurement is you want to set aside the time to collect data along the way. So again, I just want to advocate that wherever possible to think about, could I be collecting information at this point as I'm delivering a service? If there's a natural point at the beginning of a process where you're learning about it, a prospective individual, a new member of your organization, a new potential client, and you're asking information that's going to help inform design, that might also be a great time to capture some baseline data on them so that you can monitor progress over time. Or if you work with a group of youth, like I used to at Boys and Girls Club, and they're coming to the club to participate in activities, Maybe there's a way you can embed data collection into the activities. One great example I like to share is an after-school program that combined health education with basketball. So most of the kids wanted to play basketball. They didn't necessarily want the health education. But what they did was they did a health education class, and they asked the kids to answer questions at the end. It was in a fun, interactive way. But the way that they scored on their end-of-class um, questions that was meant to design, design to measure knowledge was the starting score for the basketball game. So they embedded the data collection into their, into their program so much so that it then served as a jumping off point for another part of the activity. So point being, you can be creative about how you can collect data along the way. But in my experience, organizations that collect data as they go are more likely to stick to it. And then, as I said before, in, in various different ways, you need to set aside the time and resources to review and learn from your findings. And the goal here is then you just repeat, right? You do step one, two, and three, and then as you learn, you repeat the process again. As you add new programs, you embed this habit and this practice into your work. And as you do that, you reinforce the idea that we're collecting data for a reason. We're collecting it because we're looking at it. And we're looking at it so we can inform our design. And even if you're just looking at one or two things, as soon as people see that you're looking at it and ask questions and think carefully about what those results mean, chances are they're going to be more bought into the process as you move ahead. So the other thing to keep in mind just to support your efforts, and again, this is based on my own experience with clients um, as well as what the research shows, you want to ensure that people know this isn't about penalizing people. It's not about catching someone doing something wrong, but it really comes back to that mission, that first point that someone shared when we solicited feedback at the very beginning. It comes down to are we helping people? Are we able, and if we're not, are we able to improve our approach so that we can? And it can be really critical to frame it in that way because, you know, human beings being who we are can sort of immediately get nervous that this is about judging me. And you want to make it really clear, it's not about judging an individual staff. It's about understanding if interventions are working. And if they are, supporting that. And if they're not, finding a way to help ensure that they do moving forward. The other thing that I found can be really critical to supporting the efforts is actually creating formalized 
format like reports or dashboards, a place where all this data can go regularly because it can be hard to get into the habit of looking at it if you don't have a place where it's going to go. So thinking ahead to the format where it's going to go. Again, you may already have a monthly report or a quarterly report, but maybe it looks mostly at demographics and service units. Maybe adding a couple outcome data points to this existing report is the key to kind of getting into that habit. And the other thing is carving out the time. I was on a panel once where someone said, you know, it's hard to think about setting aside time for this right now. Like if someone asked me right now, I'd say, I don't have time to look at my results. But she said, what I found is if I looked ahead three months, my calendar is generally open enough that I could say, but in three months, I'll have time. And she would block time on the calendar and the staff would know that was the time. And the first couple cycles of those three months, often it was the day before that everybody was scrambling to get the data ready to review, but they held the meeting, they talked about it, and they did it again in three months, again, at, when people's schedules were a little more clear. And the next time around, maybe people scrambled a little bit less and they got more into the habit. So it's about putting that time on the calendar and committing to it and letting that ultimately help reinforce the habits that you're trying to build. Because this really is about a cultural shift. Right? I want to acknowledge, as I said early on, measuring impact is not easy. Um, in, in many cases, it represents shifting away from thinking about what you do to answering that question, so what? How are people different or better off? And that represents a really big cultural shift in thinking. To me, I, I like metaphors, as you probably picked up on a call today. But to me, this is a lot like building a new muscle, right? And, and so as a result, it's going to take some time. And so I want to go back to this idea of like not knowing where to start and worrying it's going to be unruly. It doesn't have to be unruly. You also don't have to do it all right away. But you do want to know that you're going to have to carve out a little bit of time on a regular basis to pay attention to these things. And as a result, it's going to require discipline. When you have competing demands, things that are more habits to, uh, for you not to look at these results, you have to try to resist that urge and stick to this habit, just like you would if you were getting in a new workout regimen. And these frameworks that you're going to get after the webinar are really designed to help keep you focused and keep things simple strategically so that you can keep that discipline of we committed to tracking these couple of things, let's not go off track, let's stay disciplined and focused on these. That being said, there may be some pain involved because by the way, any kind of cultural change in an organization will come with a little bit of pain, right? It's a, it represents a shift in thinking, it may represent a shift in how people spend their time. You want to acknowledge that. It's not a reason not to do it though, right? So because in the end with commitment, and the right plan in place, there really can be a huge payoff. Again, not just in your ability to tell your story externally, but in your ability to understand internally if the difference you're seeking to make is actually happening. And to really put your time and energy into things that are meaningful so that as you have success, you know you're headed on the right path. And so as I said, that's a lot of information I know to digest at the end of the day. Um, so I want to pause there and see if I can field some questions from the group. Uh, yep. Yeah. Hi, Laurel. Uh, so here's a question. Who is responsible for data collection and analysis? Development that program is, or finance? That is a great question. Um, so I will say that ideally, in the most successful situation, everyone in the organization mm -hmm. should see data and data collection and data review as part of their job. And one of the risks of having a data department, in my experience, as much as those of you that don't have one might think that that's to the saving grace, um, in my experience, when you do have one, it can create the expectation that data is that department's worry and not mine. But really, on an in an organizational um, setting where I've seen this work best, everybody has a role and everybody understands their role. So perhaps the line staff's responsibility is in, this is making an assumption that people all committed to clarifying which, was, which things were going to be tracked and how, and hopefully different minds came together for that. But line staff might mm -hmm. have a responsibility for data collection. Supervisors have a responsibility for creating a forum 
for people to review the data and certainly as a program director or manager to look at the data and make adjustments. Senior level has a responsibility to also look at and talk about the data. Development obviously has responsibilities to external stakeholders, but I think the other role that's critical is bridging the gap and making sure development and program are on the same page. One of the things that people run into the most difficulty with in this is development committing to outcomes that the program team didn't think were right or realistic. And so using that step one of the process to get everybody on the same page around your program plan can be a really great way to make sure as things are being committed to in a proposal that they're actually you know, reasonable and feel meaningful. And so that's a very long-winded way of saying everybody to some extent, I think the bulk of the actual data collection and use ideally in most cases falls on the program team with support as needed from technology, from the data department, from supervisors, development, et cetera. Okay, that's great. So, um, uh, we, we had a question earlier about um, how, what are the metrics that you look at? And mm -hmm. I'm gonna add on, I'm gonna add on to that. Are there, so uh, with two follow-ups to that, one is, uh, are there core metrics that are, you know, somewhat universal um, or um, that, you know, that most organizations would be looking for? And then secondly, what's a, what's a reasonable number of elements to be looking at or trying to track? Um, is it 20? Is it five? Is it three? Is it a hundred? Um, mm -hmm. When you're, mm -hmm. when you're going through this process. So. Right. Uh, so. Great question and, and addendum to the question. If you start <laughs> with <laughs> if you start with step one, hopefully you're getting really clear about the outcome all, of all of the potential outcomes. Those outcomes you're in the best position to influence, so that when you get to step two and start to ask the question about metrics, you have a sense that okay, for example, one of our most important outcomes is clients will. Um, become gainfully employed or get, you know, secure employment. If it makes sense in the context of your program that that's a priority outcome, then it falls under number two. This is selecting, choosing what to track wisely. And then you ask yourself exactly what you just asked. Are there metrics out there based on research that's been done, based on industry standards, that represents an effective measure for em employment? Or if it's about, um, you know, academic performance. Are there metrics out there that would represent and exist as valid indicators that that outcome has been achieved? So what metrics make sense for you has to start with first knowing your outcomes and feeling like those are the outcomes you want to get behind. And then step two is looking at what does the industry say? So there are in some industries more metrics that exist, you know, employment, housing, education, um, some of those um, programs have more industry standard kind of metrics. Others, there's different versions, you know, arts programs, um, different social service models. Depending on your intervention, there might be a metric out there. What I would say is key here is don't let the metric dictate the outcome. Start with the outcome, get behind the outcome, and then go and see if you can find a metric that makes sense in your context. So sometimes people will say, oh, well, like improved confidence is a key outcome. And if it's a public speaking course, for example, it's not general improved confidence, it's improved confidence speaking publicly. So you wanna make sure your metric is actually aligned with confidence as it relates to that, not confidence more generally. So that would be one recommendation as it relates to core metrics and, and what metrics exist. The next piece about what's the ideal number, it's going to be an unsatisfying answer, but it's, it's going to be, it depends. It depends on your capacity. So it's, it's like you want to measure at least one outcome. To me, there, there's no yeah. excuse for not measuring at least one. If that's all you can do and still get to the finish line, start there. If you feel like you could reasonably measure a couple outcomes, then a couple is right. But the other thing you have to keep in mind is this is not the only thing you're tracking, right? Outcomes are often going to be tracked in addition to looking at outputs or scope of service and other data points this organization may be looking at. So you want to look at that full plate of what you have to track and just make sure you leave a little space 
for the outcomes. And sometimes that means letting go of some of those old data points you've been tracking forever and never looked at. So again, it's this idea that you have to make room for outcomes, and if that means letting go of things that are less important, then do that, but you want to make sure you're moving forward in a way that's useful to you. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and frustrating. Uh, yeah. So let's uh, let's say now, you know, we have a, a lot of folks on the call. Uh, what and if if you're on the call and you're not currently doing this or you're not currently doing this as well as you would like, um, what are some next steps for folks uh, who want to who want to seriously get started uh, measuring outcomes? Mm -hmm. So one thing that my experience has shown and that the research will show is that you need to have senior leadership supporting this initiative. So if you're Mm -hmm. A senior leader and you're on this call, understand how critical your role is in creating the forum to let this work happen. Because there are always going to be competing demands and oftentimes a leader has to give staff permission to pay attention to this and maybe not pay attention to something else for the time being. So if you're a leader, understand the importance of that and setting the tone that this is about, as I said earlier, improving programs, not penalizing staff. And also think about the importance of um, in involving multiple people in the conversation. Now, if you're not a senior leader, but you know that it's important or you feel like it's critical to your organization, take what I just said and think about how can I work with the leadership that I have that maybe isn't fully bought into this to advocate and ensure that we have a little time and space to do this work. Doing this on organization-wide level may not be practical for really large organizations. You may want to start the initiative and convey it organization-wide, that it's an organizational priority. But depending on the size of your organization, in terms of practical application, you might have to start somewhere. And so often I recommend people start with like the lowest hanging fruit. What program is there currently the most interest in this kind of thing? Maybe it's because the program director sees the value and it's not a huge uphill battle to convince them. Or maybe it's because there's a movement afoot and this the department really needs data and so that they make sense as a group to engage so point being you got to start somewhere and so if you want to do this well or build momentum often once you have buy-in from leadership it's about finding a group that you can get started with and build some momentum around and they're going to help sort of move the process forward then the last thing i'll say is and it's been implied a couple places but this really has to be both a top-down and bottom-up Process. So you want the leadership to sort of convey how important it is, and you want some thought leadership on key things. But in my experience, the groups that do this well are engaging the staff that's doing the work day to day in conversations around what outcomes matter and what data makes sense and how to collect it. Because as I said before, they're often the linchpin in whether this gets done or not. So bringing them to the table to have conversations is a really good strategy for supporting efforts moving forward. Got it. Okay. Um, click to the next slide. You have uh, a really excellent uh, guidebook that is available mm -hmm. for folks that are interested in uh, kind of learning more, taking the next step. Is, you, is that your internet running wildly slow? Might be. All right. The, oh, it's up. Okay. Um, so, uh, for everybody who uh, attended today's call, we've got some uh, additional materials that we'll get out to you. Um, all of you had the chance to get the copy of the PowerPoint, which we really appreciate, Laurel. Uh, do you want to talk for a moment about the uh, about the guidebook? Sure. So the guidebook is really just a companion to what we talked about today. It goes into a lot more detail. It can't, It comes from the fact that after doing many trainings, half days, webinars, full days, multi-days, I always just felt like I could talk about everything I wanted to or people that were there wanted to be able to take something back to people that weren't. So the guidebook is based on the steps we just talked about. It includes exercises to support the efforts and is really meant to be this workbook that will help you as you move ahead with a process like this. Got it. Um, okay, well, we really appreciate it. A couple of, uh, a couple of slides uh, about JMT uh, just before we wrap up. JMT, are, which were the hosts for today's call, and we really appreciate Laurel's uh, work today. Uh, we're a, a 
been in the nonprofit industry since 1991. It's all we do. We're a technology consulting shop based in uh, just north of White Plains, New York and Austin, Texas. Uh, we really focus on helping nonprofits from a technology uh, standpoint. And uh, so our uh, we have a number of partners that we work with. Well, if you could just advance it to that. Um, and uh, so our our focus is to be a uh, kind of an end-to-end -end solution uh, with nonprofits um, who are looking to uh, focus on improving their technology stack. A number of our partners are there. Um, uh, however, as a consulting shop, our primary focus is, is helping our clients improve their performance. Um, and clearly, lots of the things that go into outcomes uh, have some technology under foundation to support them. Um, and then the, the next slide is, if you have any interest in exploring that, uh, our website is uh, jmtconsulting.com. And there's a button on there. You can either download some content uh, that we have that uh, hopefully will be helpful to you, or you can press the button for a free con uh, consultation, and that is just simply a time to spend with one of our consultants uh, uh, doing an initial exploratory kind of discussion with you to see if it even makes sense for you to pursue it as an organization. Um, with that, if there are no additional questions, and we really do appreciate um, your time with us today, Laurel, uh, any final comments from you before we wrap up? Um, I'll just reference a quote that um, Arthur Ashe made a long time ago that I like to um, parallel here, which is start where you are, use what you've got, do what you can. And to me, it perfectly sums up, hopefully, the themes that you got today. This is too important not to do. Don't feel like you have to do it all right away. But don't let fear keep you from starting. Take some steps, be strategic about it, and trust that your process will support itself if you follow some of the guidelines we covered today. Very good. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a, have a great rest of your day. We look forward to seeing you again on another one of our webcasts. Take care. Thank you. Bye.